He never knew his mother. This is not his land. He's trying to be king, king consort, dragon king, whatever. He's trying to claim the title for himself versus the title being bestowed upon him by the sovereignty goddess. Okay, so if we consider Alice being that individual who could bestow that title upon him, then of course she's going to demand an initiation process from him. She has to uh, assess if he's even the right man for the job. And when she sees uh, under his command, you know, the Bracken lands and, and, and Stonehenge and these places being desecrated under his command, then she's what, you know, she has to question herself, is this the right man for the job? It's a pity, don't you think, that you never knew your mother? So Damon decides he really needs to repair Heron Hall, get it built up, get it back to um, a functional state. He says there's going to be a large host of men that are going to be arriving here soon. Um, Sir Simon is like, well, we have no coin. Like, we have no money. But Damon refuses to ask Rhaenyra for any sort of help, so he decides to just fix it himself, I guess. He's, he's going to DIY Heron Hall. Doesn't sound like a smart idea. So we see him starting to repair things, uh, using an axe, fixing the place up, doing what he can. It's going to take a lifetime and then some. <laughs> And of course, Damon, hey, I'm the kind of gal that appreciates a construction kind of man. So I love watching him work. Hey, I could, I could take more of this. I'm enjoying it. But he's got blisters on his hands. And even though he's a fierce warrior and stuff, you can tell this is not his normal kind of work. Alice, she's watching him. And I would like to point out, as she's watching him from above, as he's working down in like the center hall or what have you, she's standing behind that stone balcony and it's all flowers in the stone. That's like the design of flowers. So we talked about last week, Alice being associated with the goddess Bloodwith, who was called Flower Face. And she is also uh, cursed to be an owl. And I, you know, so I was reading a little bit more. I have this great book called Avalon Within. And um, it has a lot of, you know, different stuff about the goddesses associated with Avalon, Bloodwith being one of them. And they talk about her. And, and remember last week on the live stream, we talked about the parallels with Persephone and uh, Demeter and Hades and the underworld and like kind of the purple that's associated with um, Heron Hall and like the Eleusinian mysteries, which are also associated with the color purple. I was having some more thoughts about this because Blodoweth is cursed as an owl, but she's also made of flowers and she is called Flower Face. And in the book I was reading, they're talking about how she kind of has this dual aspect where in the daytime, she is a flower faced like springtime uh, goddess. And then by night, she is the owl huntress, right? So just like Persephone, who Persephone is the goddess of spring, but she spends a, a third of the year in the underworld with Hades as his queen, there's this duality, the spring goddess by day, but uh, owl, dark huntress goddess by night, right? So, hmm, are we seeing this? Are we getting more of the underworld symbolism with Alice in these in this scenes? Okay, just saying, like the, it's there. She can hear the voices of the people mourning and weeping as they're being assaulted. She says she can hear the cries of women and children from Brackenland, from Stonehenge and Lambswold and Mori. And she can hear the, what she hears, she hears on the wind, cries of anguish. And Damon is like, yeah, well, war is terrible. Like these things happen. But Alice is like, this isn't war. This is um, crimes against the innocent. Clearly, like she's hearing the 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 aftermath of like the actions of the Blackwoods who are, you know, committing atrocities on behalf of Damon in order to try and get more men. And she's like, is this really men that you want serving you, the men under duress? And then we later have the other river lords who come in and they confront Damon and they are saying how the Blackwoods are destroying their sacred places that are associated with the old gods. 
and they're desecrating their sacred lands and things like that. So I want to bring up the idea. I've talked about this in many of my videos and in my live streams, but sovereignty goddesses, and even Rhaenyra refers to herself as the sovereign, okay? Sovereignty goddesses are associated with the land. They are a goddess of the land. They are a representation of the land. So in ancient Celtic mythology, um, you have the kings who are often warrior kings, and then they are married to like this, the queen of the land or the goddess, okay? And they have goddess rituals. They're like sex rituals that take place on certain days of the year. This is a very Avalonian King Arthur concept with like the lady of the lake. So Let's, let's look at it through that lens. So King Arthur is a warrior king of Britain, right? The pen dragon in title. How did he gain that title? Well, the sovereignty goddess bestowed it upon him. So these men um, are tested in certain ways or go through a certain ritual with Arthur. For example, it was the running of the stag. So he had to defeat the stag king, which is the, the king stag, basically. So the strongest deer on on the aisle on dragon aisle okay and so there's the herds of deer the ones with the you know largest rack the largest antler that he had to defeat the stag king by hand he was not allowed to take a weapon or anything so what he did he's disguised himself as a deer he wears deer fur he wears fake antlers this is reminiscent of the isle of faces the green men who are said to have antlers and so what he does is he poses as a deer. He goes, he defeats the stag king by hand. And therefore he is the chosen pen dragon. He proves himself to be worthy of that title. The lady of Avalon, the high priestess of Avalon, she acts as the sovereignty queen. She acts as the lady of the lake, which is actually the sovereignty goddess of Avalon and of Britain. Okay. So you think of, Let's think of Monty Python, you know, shimmering white Samite and she thrusts the sword at, at King Arthur and that kind of thing. That is the sovereignty goddess. She is the embodiment of the land. Okay. And so when she chooses her king, her stag king, he is the protector of the land and they have a sacred marriage. So they, they are devoted, dedicated to each other. And the king may have a queen. He may have a wife who is the queen, but he is also married to the land, and that is his sacred duty. When I take King's Landing, Rhaenyra is welcome to join me there and take her place by my side, king and queen, ruling together. Kind of a complicated relationship, but what I'm seeing here with Alice is that she is that. She is the sovereignty goddess of the land. And I also want to point out in season one, Rhaenyra, when she sees the white stag, that is her form. That is her initiation or her, you know, testing right there. Kristen wanted to kill the stag and all the men wanted to kill the white stag. But what did the um, hunter say to Viserys? He said, before the dragons were kings in this land, the white stag was the symbol of kingship. The white stag presents himself to Rhaenyra in season one. And so that's how we know that she is actually the sovereignty queen versus the sovereignty king, right? But anyway, so she is the sovereignty queen. But if Damon is her husband, what's what's the what's the husband of the the queen? Well, he's the king, consort. <laughs> but so he has to kind of get his own sacred initiation, which Alice is giving him. But it's got a lot of Arthurian overtones. And then we have this layer of like competition of like, well, is he raising an army for me or is he raising an army for himself? It's a complicated concept. And the Lady of the Lake is not the only sovereignty queen. Like we even um, talked about last week with St. Winifred, you know, these, these saints or these, um, these goddesses who are associated with certain streams or rivers or uh you know that kind of thing too springs sacred springs and that kind of thing persephone also because the spring she is the spring okay anyways <laughs> why is this my favorite thing to talk about guys <laughs> but yes exactly the bridegroom of christ yes yes exactly i love it so like yes 
exactly. A god's wife, I think they call those. So I believe Alice is like a sovereignty goddess. You know, she is sort of this otherworldly figure. There's the potential that she is a very ancient person. You know, she's sort of this ageless individual. Nobody really knows where she came from or how old she is. You know, oh, they say she's potentially Sir Lionel's illegitimate daughter, but then they also say that she may have been the wet nurse to Sir Lionel. So it's difficult to know where her true origins lie. And that's what makes her so interesting because we can kind of speculate on these things. And especially when she's throwing out, oh, I'm a barn owl. And, you know, and then these, the layers of things that are associated with that make it even more interesting to read into. So and that's what I'm here for. If you guys are into like mythology and that kind of thing, you know, this is, this is my jam. So, all right. So yes, the white stag reminds me of Nat and yellow jackets. Now she is queen. Exactly. So uh, Natalie and yellow jackets, she saw the white moose is who presented himself to her. And the white moose is kind of an equivalent of the white stag in indigenous cultures. White animals in general are typically a, a good omen or like a special omen in um, indigenous cultures. We see it like with white buffalo, white moose, white deer, white stags, you know. Okay, the white elk is the land and the land chose Rhaenyra. Exactly, exactly. So now kind of Damon has to go through his own initiation process because Damon and Rhaenyra are so equal to each other. They are, you know, two halves of a whole. And I talk about that in my eye for an eye video. The eye of Ra is associated with both male and female power, right? And so the um, it's a female source of inspiration, of creativity versus the male force is the violent aspect, right? So we kind of see that balance with Damon and Rhaenyra for sure. After the river lords come and they sort of confront Damon and say, we wouldn't bend our knee to a tyrant. And then Damon goes over and he stares into the fire and then it cuts to Rhaenyra as the opposite angle, she's staring into the fire. That was like their eye of raw moment, like where they're understanding. And again, that's a parallel to Halamond, which happened, you know, in the throne room earlier in the episode. I do think that when Alice says uh, to him, when she points out, it's a pity that you never knew your mother. I think that's another hint as to her identity being a sovereignty goddess because the sovereignty goddess is also called like a mother goddess. She is the mother goddess of the land. Um, and so when he, like, I think that's also part of like the mother wounding that she's exposing there because he never knew his mother. This is not his land. He's trying to be king, king consort, dragon king, whatever. He's trying to claim the title for himself versus the title being bestowed upon him by the sovereignty goddess. Okay, so if we consider Alice being that individual who could bestow that title upon him, then of course she's going to demand an initiation process from him. You know, she has to assess if he's even the right man for the job. And when she sees uh, under his command you know, the Bracken lands and, and, and Stonehenge and these places being desecrated um, under his command, then she's what, you know, she has to question herself, is this the right man for the job? So I think those places are all sort of in her domain. And that's why she can hear the voices of the people who live on those, live on that land, because it is her, it's her land. And like, you know, the hollow hills kind of vibe. So um, so yeah, I kind of think that's like the thing with Alice. Like, I, you know, we're like, who is she? You know, she's the witch queen of hair and all. She's, you know, this sort of mysterious witchy lady, but really what it comes down to and, and going back to her being associated with purple, purple being a color that is for royalty, for emperor, for the high priestess of, you know, the Eleusinian mysteries, for example, uh, Clearly, she is a woman who holds a lot of power. One other goddess that came to mind with Alice and with her saying that she is a barn owl was the Kaliak, which we didn't really talk about last week. But the Kaliak is also in Celtic mythology, in Scottish and Irish mythology. She is the embodiment of winter. Okay, so this could be significant. 
Um, potentially. So the Kaliak is an old woman goddess. She presents as an old, ancient woman. She's very ugly. She's the embodiment of winter. And so when she comes, she brings the winter with her. She has this staff that she walks with, an old gnarly wooden staff that um, is said when she her staff hits the ground, it turns to ice and snow. She also has an owl that sits on her staff, and that's like her animal. And owls in general, you know, they are associated with a lot of like death and bad omens. And, and so as like the Kaliak herself, she's kind of a basically, okay, if you're familiar with like the Oak King and the Holly King myth, where it's like a summer king and winter king. And the same goes for the Kaliak. She's the winter queen versus Brigid, who is uh, her spring counterpart. She is the spring queen, the queen of May. So the Kaliak is like an old woman versus Brigid, who is like a young spring maiden. So there is potentially the idea that Alice could be associated with the Kaliak because the Kaliak is associated with winter and the winter stuff. And so Damon potentially facing like, you know, this once and future king or the prince that was promised sort of prophecy um, and fulfilling it, you know, you have to wonder like, you know, the opposite, like she is associated with winter, with darkness, and she brings the winter versus Damon and the prince that was promised who brings fire, they're the light bringer and that kind of thing to, to combat the long night. So if Alice is potentially the owl of the Kaliak. Is she some sort of harbinger of winter or some someone who knows something more? Um, it's just an idea. I don't necessarily I feel like she's more associated with Bloodwith and that kind of myth versus the Kaliak myth, but I thought I would present all options to us and see if what, like we might talk something out here and see what we can figure out. It's just an idea. But all right, let me catch up with the chat. Yes. Um, so Kaliak found in Gaelic myths, often called the old hag. Yes. I made a video about the Kaliak like years ago. Like, um, it's one of my older videos. So if you guys want to learn more about her, um, cause she is a figure in certain Arthurian myths, like, um, Morgan Le Fay is strongly associated with the Kaliak. So, um, and Morgan Le Fay is also strongly associated with Alice Rivers. So there's, there is a connection there. There is something there. Is it just me or have the dragons in House of Dragons gotten sexier? 